actions for which I received the Medal of Honor. I, I did for my brothers what I knew they would do for me. It had very little to do with being big, bad, and brave. You simply do for your brother what, you know, I know you'll swim across that river and get me, so how could I not swim across that river and get you? That night, they hit us at 2 o'clock in the morning. There were 42 of us young artillerymen. We had some infantry that had been assigned as our guard, perimeter guard, uh, but they were not with us, with us. Uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, they started mortaring us. There was a, a reinforced heavy weapons battalion of enemy, and that's not normal. I mean, in Vietnam, normally, if you've seen 10 or 15, that was a big force. Uh, so the fact that there was 1,500 of the enemy was just totally overwhelming us mentally. Uh, my howitzer, 105 howitzer, was set up right on the edge of a, of a little canal, uh, about 30 meters across. And I could see the enemy gathering in the jungle on the other side. Um, after the, the mortaring lasted one half hour exactly, it started at 2, and at 2.30 exactly it quit. And because of all the boom, boom, boom going around, when it quit, the silence was just you know, almost overwhelming. And we could hear the enemy on the other side talking and shouting us, GI, tonight you die. I mean, that's how close they were. So we're looking at each other. I mean, we'd never experienced anything like that before. So this was, uh, uh, my Sergeant James Gant said, okay, boys, this is it. So we got up out of our little foxholes. We couldn't dig foxholes deeper than 18 inches because of the water. And as Sergeant Gant said, you, if you're wounded, you cannot lift your head up more than 18 inches. Uh, so don't dig your foxholes, which 18 inches is the depth of the average man. So if you're laying flat, you're, you know, the foxhole's doing its job. So we got up out of our foxholes, got to the gun, we loaded a beehive round, and waiting for Sergeant Gant to tell us to fire. And he was waiting for clearance the, for the infantry to say, yes, all of our men have been moved to your side of the river, so you can go ahead and fire. And although it didn't, in reality, it didn't take but a few minutes, it seemed like an eternity. When you're standing there, 105 howitzers, you're very exposed, and there's 1,500 people shooting at you. So it's from 50 yards away. So it was, you know, we, were, we wanted to fire that first round of beehive as quickly as possible. And when Sergeant Gant got the clearance, talking into his handset, and he said, yes, sir, fire. And we fired the howitzer. Well, I was the guy that actually fired the piece. And when I pulled the lanyard and fired, the enemy had set up a recoilless rifle on the other side of the, the canal. And he fired at my muzzle blast. It didn't hit the muzzle. It hit the little shields that's on the side of the 105 howitzer. And that's what I was trying to hide behind. So the round hit the shield eight inches from my head. And that's one of the reasons why I'm deaf today. <laughs> It was because oh, that's the excuse I give my wife anyway, and that blew me, blew all of us off the piece, and I, it, traumatic brain injury, is what didn't know the name of it then. Today we know it was traumatic brain injury. I woke up, laying flat on my back, in my foxhole, and I'm looking up at the night sky, which was starry, and I seen all the tracers coming right over the top of my foxhole. Our tracers were red. The enemy's tracers were white, blue, or green, depending on which communist nation had been surprised or supporting the firefight. So when I opened my eyes that night, and there was red, white, blue, and green tracers, and I had the traumatic brain injury, I'm thinking, wow, this is just like Christmas. Because it, it re And this was in mid-November, so I, my heart was thinking about it. So that's what I'm thinking, wow, it's just like Christmas. I couldn't hear nothing, although the battle was raging around me because of the damage to my eardrums. And I'm laying there. I don't think I lie there maybe 10 or 15 minutes before my hearing started coming back and the smoke started clearing out of my head. And I realized, well, this is not where I was standing seconds ago in my mind that's just seconds ago I'd been standing I, I had I remembered firing the howitzer 
And then I woke up here, well, where am I at? What's, what's happening? And I raised up on one elbow. My, my foxhole was right on the edge of the canal and the enemy was coming across. They were waiting across the canal to get to us. And that's, the night started there. I grabbed my M16, started doing my job as a soldier. I had, I had 12 clips, which is roughly 180 rounds. And I was doing my job as a soldier when I had expended all but three rounds. And I don't know why it was so important to me to have save three rounds, but I, I wanted to save the three rounds. And I looked at my howitzer. Well, it had continued to get hit by mortar fire, by a 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, it was totally blown up. But I thought, well, because I didn't have any more ammunition for the small arms, at that point, I'd, I, don't, I didn't know if any of our, our men were dead, but I didn't know if any other were alive. I mean, and that sounds foolish now, but that's the, the rage of battle. I didn't know what was happening around me. I took for granted that because the fighting was so intense where I was, that it was equally that intense at, at all the guns. Uh, I thought, well, maybe I can get off one round from the old howitzer. So I crawled around through the mud. Uh, I wanted to fire a beehive. Are you familiar with the beehive round? I wanted to fire a beehive round because of its effectiveness. And I found the beehive round. I set it on muzzle action. I, I loaded the round. Actually, I laid the, the beehive projectile itself in the breech. And then I found the canister. I had to find powder. You know, nothing was going the way we had been trained to do it. Uh, but I finally found enough powder, loose powder. The powder 105 howitzer comes in bags, and that's the way it had been trained. You, you put seven bags of powder for a maximum charge. Well, the first few minutes of me crawling around, I was looking for the bags of powder. Well, the bullets and the bombs had tore, blown open all the bags. There was no bags, but there was powder They're laying in the mud and under the water. And I remember feeling it, it's like pellet powder is a misnomer. It's, it's actually, it looks like gerbil food or something. And I could feel it under the water and I picked it up swished it around and I said yep that's part of my powder so I started putting the wet powder in the canister and I f when, when you put the seven bags of powder into the canister it fills the canister up now what I didn't stop and take into consideration is the fact that because they're in bags there's a lot of loose airspace it's not totally full of powder but I wanted it to be maximally effective so I filled the canister full of loose powder uh, Fort Seal, Oklahoma, the home of artillery, uh, later told me that I had probably fired like a charge 20 or 21 in a howitzer that when it's maximally effective, charge 7 is maximum charge. And my howitzer was blown up. The recoil mechanism was, mechanism was totally blown off of it. The, the colonel said, son, you probably shouldn't have let a firecracker off in that breach and you fired a charge 20 or 21 in it. That's why it rolled over me. That's why it, it had the effect that it did, but it worked. The beehive went out and did its job, and as it rolled over me, well, I got back up, and I was, it broke my ribs. I had a beehive in my back. Uh, one of the, well, I had almost 30 in my backside, same place that Forrest was shot. Uh, and so I, I was hurting, but when I rolled over, and I could see the swath right through the enemy that my round had taken, and I thought, Wow, well, maybe I can get off one more round. And I one more rounded it for as long as I could. When I read, I had fired all the beehive round that I could find. I fired uh, HE, high explosive, which is the regular artillery round. And that was only one or two rounds that I could find. I remember firing one white phosphorus round. Uh, the last round that I fired was a propaganda round, which is a leaflet and you fire it up over the enemy and the leaflets come floating down. And that was the last round that I had found. Well, I fired it, and then I seen one of my brothers, Gwendell Holloway, about 75 yards off to my left on the other side of the river, jump up, and he waved his boonie hat and he said, don't shoot, I'm a GI! And it just crushed my heart to think that I'd been firing at my brother, because I thought everybody was back on our side of the river. Well, I've, I've got to go get him. One of my mama's rules was that, you'd, son, you don't leave your brother in the woods. <laughs> 
So I, it, I had to go get him. I mean, there was no other thought at all. I had to go get my brother. Well, because of the shape that my body was in, I'd been shot in the right thigh with a Nike 47. My uh, ribs on the right side was crushed. My fourth lumbar vertebra was one of the beehive had stuck in it. And when the cannon ran over me, it split the, bee or it split the vertebra. It didn't sever my spine, but it caused swelling. And I think this was a gift from God because I had reduced, now I wasn't numb, but I had reduced sensation from about here down. Well, from the fourth lumbar, lumbar down, uh, when I got shot in the, by the AK, I mean, every soldier worries what it feels like to be shot. And when he shot me, well, before he could shoot me again, I did my job as a soldier. And as I'm laying there on the ground, and I look down at my leg, and man, here's this big, nasty hole in my leg. And I'm thinking, well, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> it was because I had reduced sensation. So trying to tend to business and seeing Gwendell across there, I, I knew I had to have something to help me get across the river. So I got my air mattress, which the Army had given us to sleep on. And have you ever tried sleeping on an air mattress? What always happens? You fall off and you get wet anyway. So most of us did not use the air mattresses, but we had to have them with them because they were Army issue. Well, I blew it up and there were bullet holes in it. I remember tying it off. I had a section about, about half of the air mattress and just happened to be up where you blow it, the, where the little hole was that you blew it up at. That, had, that was good, so I just tied it off and tied it in a tight knot, and I slipped off into the water and start making my way across the canal. Uh, and what I did not realize at the time, but later my guys told me, said they could see the 50 cal shooting the water, and they could see these big coming up, but they all they could see was an air mattress, because I was underneath the water swimming, but I didn't dare let go of the air mattress so here's the air mattress sticking up going across the canal i mean i didn't it didn't dawn on me that that's what was happening but they said it looks so strange to see this air mattress just going like heck across the canal when i got to the other side i stuffed the air mattress i was using where Gwendell was as a marker uh, a palmetto uh, yellow palmetto tree and it was about I don't know, four or five foot tall. So that's where I'd last seen him. So that's where I was working my way towards. Now, I didn't have a weapon. Uh, the enemy, there were a lot of enemy dead on the other bank, and there were a lot of weapons. But because of the beehive stuck in the weapons, I mean, the first 10 or 15 rifles that I came across, man, I'm trying to find one that would work, and you couldn't even make the, the breech work because the beehive actually stuck through the metal. And that's a lot of motion. And any soldier, any hunter knows that motion is what gets your attention. So I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to. So after the 10 or 15, I, I didn't look anymore. I just, well, I would let the enemy just run right over me. They were coming on salt waves. And after they got past me, then I'd start crawling again. Finally, I made it to where Gwendell, where I'd last seen Gwendell. And when I reached the foxhole, I looked in it. And instead of one man being in it, there were three men in it. This had taken me probably 45 minutes from my bank to where I'd reached Gwendell, and I knew that I didn't have the physical strength left to make three trips, and I asked the man above to give me the strength to carry all three of my brothers. So I picked up Jim Deister, the man we thought was dead. He had, Jim had been shot through the head by a 9 millimeter pistol, and I picked Jim up, slid him across my shoulders with his head laying on one side of my shoulder and one leg on each side of my arm and I picked up Billy Ray and picked up uh, Gwendell, they could help. I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't fully carrying their whole weight. We were all, actually we were all helping each other except for Jim Deister and we thought he was dead, but you don't leave a brother. And we started making our way back towards the canal. Uh, Gwendell had three clips of ammunition. And so when the enemy would start making their salt wave, well, I would, would lay the guys down and do my job as a soldier. When we finally made it to the river bank, I, I had run out of ammunition. So the last two times that I laid the guys down, I used this tree trunk that when I grabbed a hold of it, the, what the picture in my head was a baseball bat. You know, the strange places your mind goes. And I used that piece of tree limb as a, as a baseball bat. 
uh, got Deister on the air mattress, got him almost across, and two of my guys, uh, Frank Gage and Bill Murray, jumped in the river and helped get Jim Deister up, and I immediately went back across. Well, Billy Ray and Gwen Dell could both hold on to the air mattress, so my job was much easier, and I just ferried them back across. And once again, Bill and Frank jumped in and helped get them to the bank. Um, there were 12 of us left standing out of the 42 that started. Now, they weren't all dead, but that morning, I mean, I remember looking around, there was 12 of us left standing, you know, and it was those other 11 men that put me in for this medal. My brothers put me in for the Medal of Honor. In the movie Forrest Gump, if it, if the, in the movie, if it has to do with the military, it's based on me and it's a fact. The rest of the movie is movie and it touches my life lightly. Uh, but the military portion of it is based on me. When the president's putting the medal on Forrest's neck, that is my actual film footage. President Johnson putting the medal around my neck, they just put Tom's face over mine. Uh, that's why they call me Forrest Gump. <laughs> And I'm slow like Forrest. <laughs> I was wounded the same place that Forrest was, but I, he did not ask. Now, if President Johnson would have asked to see where I was wounded, there is no doubt in my heart that I would have shown him where it was. I was just, now, I won't say anything about Bill Clinton, but I'd been too frightened to show Bill Clinton where I was wounded. What I enjoy the most is talking to our students, our, our children. Uh, my wife Dixie and I travel all across the United States. Actually, we've traveled all over the world because what we found is that children are children. But in the United States, we travel and we talk about the character development program and the duty on our country that the medal stands for. And then we try to share those virtues with the students from and I now some recipients don't like talking to kindergartners but we're I'm a grandpa I got 15 grandkids so I deal with the kindergartners equally well as the college students and the questions they ask when a fourth grader asks you well sergeant davis how does it feel to shoot someone it's easier to open up your heart and let them look in than when a college student asks well how does it feel to shoot someone you understand the difference? I mean, I opened up my heart and let the college student look into, but it's just, it's easier for me to answer the questions of a fourth grader because it's, they really want to know. And sometimes college students just ask questions because they think it's a cool question to ask. Uh, through this media, we can touch even more people and make understand that duty on our country is a way of life. It doesn't have to be just about the Medal of Honor. It can be the way you live your life.